Well folks, here we are sitting in my lounge room with my old friend Dr. Peter Simons and this podcast today is going to be a bit different to the normal Cell Serve Prosper radio podcast. Dr. Peter Simons is a vet of how many years? 30, 40? Uh, coming up 40. 40 years, but he's got a very interesting story to tell and also how it relates to you and high performance when it comes to sales service prosperity. So, uh, Simo, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Mate, uh, what we're going to do on this podcast, I've sent you some questions. Um, where, as I say, normally I'm talking to salespeople, entrepreneurs, business owners, sales managers about sales, but we're talking about sales service prosperity, high performance. And of course, prosperity, talk about the first wealth is health. That's going to be one of your areas. But uh, let's, uh, in, what we're going to talk particularly about today is your relationship with what you call mental health, positive mental health, high performance, brain fuel depletion. But look, why don't you introduce yourself and give people your background. Um, why are you here, do you think? Um, well, I'm here in many roles as a father and a husband and that sort of thing but I have had like a lot of people a mental health experience and a bad one and I see that as, as something that I can help people with um, what I particularly look for was an explanation about why I didn't feel well and with you get a good explanation a simple one then you can work out what to do to actually exit that particular situation I think I've been able to do it I'm pretty happy now Lee and uh, I don't mind sharing the story Great. Well, we'll dig into that story in just just a second. But as you've already said, and this is what we say in uh, the Sales and Service Academy, is everyone is in the business of selling, selling ideas, selling time, uh, selling, hey, why don't you, in fact, even me asking you to come and do this podcast. We're about getting things to happen, let alone doing business transactions, buying shoes, accounting services, legal services. And as you, you touched on before we even started recording, we're all in the business of serving, serving, serving others in one form or another and obviously we talk, we talk about mental health which we, we in the past had set up the, the positive mental health foundation because we're really talking about wellness and people performing well um, but look tell people in more detail about your relationship and in fact you've come up and developed this whole model on brain fuel depletion so maybe go through this presentation you've got some slides here to explain and maybe just go through your go through your story how did this all arise and how does it relate to selling servicing servicing prosperity being well well I think the key to prosperity is 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 feeling well mentally and physically feeling well plus having a bit of money um, it all came from me not being in a medical field as a veterinarian but not understanding why I felt so terrible, why I was suicidal and how to work my way back. Once I got the answer through a very good doctor, I said, I've got to share this message because it was such a common problem, brain field depletion or, or depression or mental ill health. So I've got to share, share the answer to that because so many people have been in the position I was in and it's hard to work your way out. Yeah, but how did you get into it in the first place? Um, well, I was, um, like a lot of my friends, um, I was trying to do a bit too much. I was very involved in different things and I was a little bit uh, depressed or brain field depleted. Then I had a brain hemorrhage, very unfortunate. Uh, and with, as a result of that brain hemorrhage, I went from being mildly depressed, I didn't know what was wrong with me, I had a little bit of anxiety, some panic attacks, to very depressed. I was called depressed, it was called depression, but I never felt sad, and I got to a stage where I was suicidal. So once I, um, after about six horrific months, I uh, was told I had depression. I said, well, I'm never sad. And they said, well, it doesn't work like that. It, it's a much more complex disease than that. So I said, well, we've got to explain it differently because um, it can't have a name that you don't understand and that doesn't give you any idea of how sick you are and what you might do to actually feel better. Well, one of those early warning signs. Now, by the way, folks, Peter and I have been mates since um, high school days, age 17, where we met each other through uh, competitive swimming in the first place. He'd been a Rotary Exchange student in South Africa, came back and noticed that I was in his spot in the swimming squad. Have you got over that yet or not? Uh, well, I got over it when I passed you. <laughs> I, I, I was fiercely determined to uh, reverse that wrong and when I did get past you, as inevitably happened, then I felt complete. Here we are now, that was like 1970 what? 
72, 73, 74. It was something. the other day, it was 1974. <laughs> it is fresh in our memories. It's amazing, isn't it? We go back a long way. So, so uh, what, what made me say that? You, you, one, of course, you were competitive. I'm a bit competitive too. Um, and so uh, you said that the warning signs, that's what I want, because you are, the, the time you said to me, Lee, I need, to, need you to come and talk to me. I want to walk the dog with you, which is like no mate has ever said, let's go walk the dog together. Um, so let's go back to that time. What was going on in your life uh, for you to even ask me to come and go walk the dog with you? Um, as I said, in the 90s, um, I was married, I had young children, that sort of thing, and I was a little bit depressed. I, I had some anxiety and uh, some panic attacks, so I didn't know that was anything to do with depression, but I hid that. I tried not to worry about it until I had the brain hemorrhage, and then the symptoms got much worse. Then the insomnia was horrific, mm. the anxiety was terrible, there were some other symptoms as well. I stopped eating, I had no appetite, I was tense all the time. And I had no answer. I felt completely isolated. And I did ask you to come down and, and quietly talk to you about this particular problem I had because I was so lost. It was amazing. I had, I was well, well acquainted with the right people. I'm not scared to ask questions about my health, but I was lost and embarrassed. That's why we had that quite confidential discussion to talk about how my symptoms had got so much worse and were damaging my lifestyle so badly. Mm. And of course, my knowledge, uh, having done a degree at Melbourne Uni in uh, Human Performance, then a master's degree over here in social psychology, uh, we always, as, as I think it was, uh, who was it that said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, a lot of things look like nails. Uh, I don't know if it was Mark Twain or someone, but um, in my case, I've immediately reverted back to, well, if you can't sleep, mate, maybe you just need to get back and get in the pool and do a bit more training and uh, tie yourself out. So I relied on my phys ed background thinking exercise was the answer. Sure, if you had gone to a dietitian, they would have said, you know, eat more greens. Um, yeah, and, but, but that wasn't very good advice. In other words, I did not have the knowledge at that point in time at all about mental health, which of course is the case with so many people. Of course, we've done a lot of work since then with our friend Neil Cole um, and depression awareness, and then of course Beyond Blue and others. Um, it, it's changed a lot since the, the 90s. But uh, even so, we had the, the North Melbourne issue the other day, the, the attempted suicide. I mean, it, it goes on and on. People, in most cases, can't recognise those early warning signs. And as you say, the um, lack of ability to sleep, the insomnia, in, now we know is a very good warning sign, isn't it? Yep. You, you were confused, Lee. I was confused. And that's why we've come up with a much simpler explanation, which is brain fuel depletion. Uh, it's a very complex disease and it affects the brain, so it's every part of the body, so the symptoms can be widely disparate, mm. hence a simple explanation for but it. Let's just go to the turning point because the, the, the penny drop, the light went on for you. And by the way, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, salesperson, sales manager, uh, either you personally will be touched at some point by this kind of anxiety and insomnia because I know guys trying to and people trying to uh, either achieve sales budgets, make payroll if they're, an, if they're a, 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 a business owner. Um, there's all these kind of stresses that start to play on people's minds um, which then can lead to insomnia, anxiety, some of these things. So if the person, if the listener isn't personally touched by it, they will have people in their life. What's the statistic? It's one in five or something like that, isn't it? Well, they say one in four women, one in six men, but we think it's much less than that. As you say, Lee, if it's not you, you'll know somebody. So everybody's touched in some ways, particularly if you're, if you're a go-getting business person, a sales person out every day, you are susceptible to this condition, um, like you know, probably more susceptible. You're trying to get a lot of things done, so, and it's a thing that does deplete you, so that hence we use the word, don't, the, the name brain fuel depletion. Yeah, there's a reasonable chance, and we see this time, time again in sales terms where guys uh, I say guys but I mean males and females um, who are behind budget um, uh, and or even worse where a person has been a high performer or a good performer and then they are not performing well uh, if if they haven't got brain fuel depletion they're on the path towards brain fuel depletion because they know my job's at risk and so as they get more stressed by this uh, behind budget um, 
and of course there's high performers as well who are, are breaking sales records so you can also be you know uh, so stressed because they're running so fast they're, they're literally living on adrenaline so why don't you run through this presentation which explains because I'm not, sorry, the point I wanted to make there was the turning point for you was you went to the doctor but you didn't go to the doctor so talk about the Glenn Kosky story um, I was lost I didn't know what to do I was trying hard but I didn't know what I tried to do then I got a rash so a rash was a medical problem and it gave me a reason to, to go and see a doctor um, because, as I said, like many people, I was reluctant to talk about my mental health. I explained the rash with my doctor and then reluctantly told him that I hadn't been going very well psychologically. And I debated whether I would and as I explained my symptoms, he kept nodding his head and it was such a relief that I wasn't alone, that he understood what I was talking about. In the end, he said, you've got depression. I said, Glenn, I haven't got that because I'm never sad. And that's when he said, it's not like that, Peter. It's much more complex. So all of a sudden, I had a name for what I had, but no understanding. But that was the key point. I was no longer alone. It was a known condition, and it was something that um, I could now work towards and try to find a solution. It took a long time, because mm. it's poorly explained, but I met the right people and developed a clear picture about how it happens and how you can get back out of this uh, out of this condition we call brain fuel depletion. All right, well, let's run through this presentation then to, to give people... Um, you can just hit the space bar if you want to, so away you go. Um, okay, well, it's... It can be all sorts of people that get this, but big brain fuel users, it's quite common. They're high achievers. People tend to think that if you get depressed, it's the quiet person who never says anything. But these people, high achievers, can deplete their brain fuels, and these include salespeople. So these people are doers, perfectionists, carers, creative people, elite performers. They're trying to do things on many levels, and it makes sense that if they try and do too much, uh, over too long a period they can deplete their brain fuel so it's very much a condition of, of, of big brain fuel users or high achievers that's a complementary term it's also in all sort of aspects of society like low socioeconomic people as well so it's across the range of people but these particular high achievers um, some of the people that I deal with and it's, it's very common well, you see, you know, so people in sales sales managers, business owners, chief execs, I mean, clearly they are high achievers. They want to get things done, they want to break records, they want to grow the business, um, they certainly want to be breaking budgets. So it fits perfectly. I mean, the, the, the demographic that we work with, people in sales, service, prosperity, want to create wealth for themselves and their family, they are really that demographic, aren't they? High achiever demographic. High achiever, but doctors, veterinarians, mm. airline pilots, mm. they're under a lot of pressure that, that have shift work. So mm. it's a range of people at, mm. at, at, at all aspects of society, but um, carers, people in hospital, nurses, um, mm. uh, and creative people. It's, it's legion, the creative people that commit suicide or have problems. Robin Williams, it just goes mm. on and on. Let's talk about brain fuels. Do you talk about which are the brain fuels in this presentation? Yes. Right, okay. Um, Brain fuels is just Tell our us name. About those photos. What were those photos about? You just did well, my, my photos about my life journey. So I had three brain hemorrhages. Now they were a problem. I had brain surgery twice. They were an issue, but I understood what was happening, mm. and uh, I was content with the with, with the care that I got. This particular issue, a mental health issue, I had no clue about. That's why I became suicidal because I couldn't understand. I didn't know why or what I should do. So. In, in, in a life of a few medical mishaps, this was by far the worst. Mm. So brain fuels is just our name for neurotransmitters. So we've got 100 billion neurons in the brain and they speak to each other. They transmit messages amongst themselves by using chemicals. So these are neurotransmitters, transmit a message from neuron to neuron, but we call them brain fuels. We've all got them and the levels can go up and down depending, particularly on the stress in our lives. And the more thinking you're doing or the more worrying you're doing or the more, uh, you know, the more time you're awake, because uh, I'm sure you talk the role of sleep in the repletion of neurotransmitters. So the more active your brain is, you're saying, the more you're using up these neurotransmitters. Yeah, the series of the serotonin. Serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine. Yeah. You're right, Lee. I mean, every day we use them up and every night we replete them as we sleep. Now, if you get, if, you, if you're busy for 16, 17, 18 hours a day, you're doing lots of using and not sleeping much and repleting. So you, you must go downhill. Let's chuck some 
three, four, five, six, seven cups of coffee a day in there, and if you smoke as well on top of that, then if you're drinking cans of Coca-Cola, what you chuck all that in on top of uh, all the thinking and activity, what happens then? Well, your brain's hyped up, you use up more brain fuel, but equally you, then you drink to quiet yourself down at the end of the night, but ah, that upsets your sleep. Yes. So it, it upsets the repletion process. So at many levels we sabotage ourselves. Mm. And people can do it, but if you're doing it day in, day out, plus having a stressful job and perhaps a stressful family life, plus all those chemicals that you add, uh, well, the society currently is very chaotic and uh, it's a massive problem. It's an epidemic problem because society is so chaotic. Garbage in, garbage out. Putting all of that in to the system, uh, the, the brain, uh, and then it all up putting it under stress. And of course, as you say, if you're drinking coffee, I would imagine after about four or four in the afternoon, certainly five and six and seven, something, the coffee is, you know, it's caffeine, it's a stimulant. I mean, you know, oh, no, it doesn't affect me. Well, it doesn't have, Yep. Uh, you're right, it, it, the coffee takes away from, from the repletion process. So it doesn't matter if you, if you use a lot during the day, if you don't use a lot but you still get no sleep, then you're going to deplete your brain fuel. Yeah. How so many hours sleep were you getting, by the way, after that, uh, brain, that, that brain aneurysm that you think was part of the triggering process? Um, when I got quite bad, I was getting about two hours, mm -hmm. from, from 9 till 11, and I'm thinking about the last three weeks. I don't really consider I slept at all. Yeah, right. It right. was completely fine. My normal pattern was to, to relax and go to sleep, but in this condition, I was absolutely wired, uh, and it was it was killing me. I, I was exhausted, but couldn't sleep, so I became increasingly dispirited by by going to bed and realizing I was just going to lie there all night and not get in any sustenance at all for, from from that no effort. Because you'll talk about therefore the role of adrenaline in that process as we move through the forward, as you began to understand this. Huh? Yes. Um, so it, it, it's fairly basic. So we say we know every day we deplete brain fuels and you do that learning and, and interacting with people. That's what you should do. And every night we're replete. So there's a very normal process that's been going on for, for hundreds of thousands or millions well, of years. Can I just add to that? You know, what we also know is there are zones of sleep. You can be asleep but not in deep sleep. And so there's the phases of sleep where we know it, that the, the, the quality of the repletion Part of that, the deep sleep component is such an important part of sleep as well, isn't it? Yeah, there's two types of sleep, REM, REM and non-REM sleep, but they both do different things, so you need a fair aspect of both. Some of it's physical renovation, some of it's mental renovation, mm. so they're both important. Mm. And, and, and I mean, there's more and more and more research going on into the importance of sleep and the quality of sleep, and of course, therefore, the things you do in the lead up to going to bed it would be looking at computer screens or iPads and iPhones and so on versus reading versus meditation or mindfulness and winding down because again I mean I've become way more conscious of this since you've done all this research and put all this work together on you know valuing sleep and in fact one of our good friends Luke George at one stage said I never watch TV I'm always too busy I'm always too. and because he, he's a swimming coach and he's into fitness and health and I said mate and it came to me you know, recovery is an important part of high performance. Exactly. I mean, you just can't keep training. I mean, you know, a good athlete, if you just train all the time or she trained, they're going to break down. Recovery is physical recovery, mental recovery. You could also say social, emotional recovery is all part of high performance, isn't it? It's all a balance. Uh, sleep is sacred. We all know it's important, but increasingly there's so much more scientific evidence to say how important it is. Um, I can feel a poster coming on, you know, that's sleep is sacred. I, should, I think I should get a photo of your head and sleep is sacred because you've said that a thousand times now, how sleep is, sleep is, you just chucked it out of your mouth. But that sleep is sacred is, a, is like almost a cornerstone of your philosophy since yeah. this is happening, isn't it? But the basis of creating research animals to measure drugs and their effect on depression is deprive them of sleep. So deprive them of sleep and stress them and that's how you'll create research animals so why would we do that to ourselves you say create research animals what do you mean by that but if you want a research animal to be depressed so you can test a drug oh, oh, how to create, oh, really? so you, how do you depress an animal don't let them sleep and then test the drug on them you see what's don't let them sleep stress them oh, and right. uh, then test the oh, drug right. on them right because that's the other interesting thing about this whole process is lack of sleep and brain field depletion, now we have a malfunctioning or underperforming 
or malnourished brain trying to work out how to solve its problem, which again was your situation, was your lack of sleep, lack of brain fuel, and you go, what's going on with me? What's going on with me? Well, the more, uh, the more you depleted your brain and didn't sleep, the less able your brain is to solve the problem anyway. But Lee, exactly. Um, it's a very complex problem. You're at your absolute worst cognitively, cognitively trying to work it out. And then it has a name, depression, of a symptom for a condition that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So it has to be simple because you're, very, you're in very poor shape to try and sort it out. So we think brain fuel depletion is a much more sensible name than depression, which is one symptom which I didn't have mm -hmm. and quite a few people don't have. Mm -hmm. It's a language you can, but when we'll get on to this, but clearly as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, I say to people in the yellow zone, the yellow zone is everything you do before you go to face to face with a customer. Um, I literally say, there's a world of what I call sales delusion, that you need to manage what's going on in your head. So if you're a business person, there's plenty of business out there. I was doing some work with a real estate company earlier in the week, and one of the guys said, oh, the market's tough, the market's tough. I said, as a, as a person in sales, you can't uh, be going on about that because you can't control the market, and you need to actually delude yourself that there's plenty of opportunity out there and, and in this case, uh, it's, it's about going, you know, I've got to be managing, be mindful of what's going on in my mind to get the most out of my performance. So what we're talking about there is the importance of, I'll call it business mindfulness, sales mindfulness, taking responsibility for what's going on in your head, um, which comes back to, as you say, uh, cognition. Um, so there's a whole science in there that we're, we're, as you become depleted with brain fuels, your thinking starts to get sillier and sillier, or in fact more and more disempowered. So the more stressed I am as a salesperson, the market's tough, the market's tough, I do the market's tough, what can I do about it? I'm now not sleeping, I might even drink more coffee or drink more grog at night, um, and so then I get less sleep, and so uh, in science it's called a negative, or is it positive, no, positive, risk, positive reinforcement cycle, in other words, it gets worse and worse and worse. So I've got to break, break that cycle. So let's keep going. Yep, no, we, we absolutely need our uh, brain fuels to be up. Uh, I suppose the key thing about the whole model is that the brain fuels deplete, which has certain symptoms, including poor cognition and poor understanding and poor uh, rationalising, that adrenaline kicks in to keep the body going. So we have these two powerful hormones, one's for chemicals. One is diminishing the brain fuels and one is increasing adrenaline. And those two pillars are the pillars of the brain fuel depletion model and they explain all the symptoms. So people literally do live on adrenaline. Pretty well living on adrenaline and it's tough living. Mm. We just quickly look at what happens when, when we get stressed as far as this depletion repletion process goes. When you're stressed, you deplete more and when you're stressed, you uh, replete less. You get le your mind's race and you get less sleep. So at two levels, you're depleting your, your brain fuels further because of stress. So we can cover, recover from that if it's a short-term problem, but if it's a long-term problem that goes on for years and the stress increases or there's other stresses added, that's when you start to run your brain fuels down um, significantly and, and uh, for long periods of time. So if we look at the depletion of brain fuels, it can be quick uh, it, or it can be medi over medium term like years or it can be very quick depending on the stress that you might be under. If we look at a picture of what a healthy neuron, then now there's, there's trillions of these in the body, synapses. We look here at a healthy level of brain fuel in the, in the neuron. We look at an electrical message coming along. The chemicals travel across the synapse and the electrical message continues. There's a healthy uh, synapse in the brain and as I say, there's trillions of them. Here's a brain that's brain fuel depleted, got less brain fuel, the message comes along, there's less chemical to go across the synapse and the message is not transmitted anywhere near as coherently as what it should be. This is a dysfunctional brain. This is what happens, as I say, over trillions of different synapses. So the electrical activity is wrong, so you actually have a malfunctioning computer by that stage. Pretty much. The electrical message comes along, the chemical transmission and onto electrical, uh, another me electrical message generator, it doesn't work well. So yeah, it's like a computer, it just can't work properly. Mm. So the two pillars, as I mentioned, the depletion of brain fuels over a period of time and their replacement with adrenaline to keep the body running. 
These two pillars explain all the symptoms. So if you look here, when you've got low level of, of brain fuels, the green line, you get poor con concentration, a bit of adrenaline in there, low energy, you're always a little bit worn out. When we go a bit further, higher levels of adrenaline, they give you all the terrible symptoms that I had, insomnia, anxiety, panic attacks, and you're in fight or flight. Fight means you argue with people, you're irritated, and flight means you become remote and withdrawn. Both things that are terrible in business and in terrible in your family life as well. As I said, if you go all the way here, your brain fuels are very low, your adrenaline levels very high, that's when you start to feel exhausted and you start to think and rationalise why perhaps suicide might be a good thing for you. Mm, heavy. So let's just look at this in the workplace. So I'm a sales manager, a business owner, either in myself or in other people. I start just, I'm just having more and more trouble or that person's energy's changed. They're, they're just not as positive as they used to be. Now I know they may even mention I'm not getting much sleep. Um, uh, the other thing which we see uh, on that green line is uh, someone who might have had a sense of humour, all of a sudden they're not laughing at what they used to laugh at. Yeah. You know, and, or if anything, they're snapping uh, at, at people, which you start to do with that, that adrenaline, the red line starts to kick in, where they're, they're much more on edge and, and towing. And again, you might start to see uh, their voice starting to shake more, they might, you might even see them getting teary uh, uh, but sooner. Um, so as a leader, manager, coach, sales manager in particular, these are signs you want to be looking for, A, in yourself, but B, in other people. Now, of course, one of the things I say to people, which is very important, if you're a leader, manager of an organisation, business owner, um, your mood sets the mood of the group. So if you're positive, happy, optimistic, healthy, um, the mood of the group will be, but if you come in in a bad mood, snappy, uh, that sets the tone of the group. you have any comments to that? No, exactly. Um, I think you're looking with, with, with these particular people at fundamental change. Somebody was a good operator, somebody with a sense of humour, somebody fairly happy, and all of a sudden there's a change. Well, not maybe all of a sudden, it might be a year or two or three years that you might notice it over, but a person is fundamentally different. Particularly if they say, I'm not sleeping. If you're not sleeping, it's almost inevitable you'll get a degree of this, so you need to watch. We say with the fight or flight response, it's critical in everybody in the business place, but particularly the manager. If he comes in in fight mode and upsets everybody, mm. and then when you're trying to sort things out, he goes into flight mode, remote and withdrawn, then he wrecks the business mm. place. He really reflects it, so it's critically important with them. It makes sense when you know that they're affected by adrenaline. certainly doesn't make it for a good, productive workplace. Mm. Mm. So mm. they're all the signs to look for, and here we think is a simple explanation about why people get like this. Mm. Mm. And once you understand this you can forgive them and if you know they've got stress at home or the kids on drugs or somebody's died you can look for these signs you can placate them you can talk to them understand them, and maybe help them get better so a simple understanding for everybody in the workplace can benefit everybody and you'll be serving people if you, if you pay attention don't get angry and frustrated and walk away you actually stay to help and ask the question are you okay are you okay judgment so that's the beautiful that move I call are you okay? Uh, how are you going? Are you okay? Let's talk. Uh, let's have a coffee or, or you know, a glass of water. That, that are you okay movement, uh, certainly as that green line is going down, um, that's making it safe in the workplace to come up and watch you. It's okay to ask someone, are you okay? And to share, because I, I say them, you know, we know the same. A problem shared is a problem halved which is you talking to me, you talking to Glenn Kosky, uh, a problem shared is a problem harm. But let's just talk about this first suicidal piece. I mean, um, uh, only since, you know, being exposed to this material and you doing this research, I never mean, forgot there was a, a person I knew in Sydney that had invested in um, some share fund. This is like, I think, around the, the time of the crash. And, uh, you know, those leveraged equity funds. So they she borrowed money against the house and then the shares had crashed and the bank had done a call on her money. We, we want 100 grand or 200 grand. And she's gone, oh my God, leave. I had uh, borrowed against my parents' house. Um, my, my son's in um, private school. I'm going to have to take him out of private school. Uh, and then she said, I've, I've, I've not been able to sleep. Um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just, I don't know if I even should be around anymore. It's like, whoa, hang on, ding, ding, ding. Now, 10 years before that, I wouldn't have picked up on 
what's your answer? Like, you can go to the doctor. And then, by the way, that person knows I knew was a jogger, and I said, you're still jogging. And I've stopped jogging. Whoa. So the whole role of exercise in the uh, serotonin and dopamine uh, stimulation uh, had stopped. So bang to the doctor and got some medication and, and now she's alive today. But I'm not saying I saved her life, but, I'm, but, but me being conscious of and aware when people are talking like that, bang, but go seek professional help. You know, what do you say to that? Exactly. It's a great thing. Are you okay is a fantastic movement for asking the question. We think it needs to be backed by a very simple explanation about why things happen, and then you'll understand why they get the symptoms. You'll remember, and you can relate them to the people. So a simple explanation with asking the question. They say 75% of suicidal people say something. They say something because they want to talk about it. People say, oh, I better not take that topic up, it might encourage them, but usually they want to discuss it. So they're dropping hints, but if you say, are you okay, from the other side, and particularly have a simple explanation like we think this one is, then we've really got a chance with these people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the beautiful thing was the other day, one of our good water polo friends, uh, he, uh, he touched base with us saying his son was uh, you know, depressed, down, you know, uh, a year or so ago, and I said, I mean, you, you touched base with him, and I said to him at training the other morning, how's your son? Made that made all the difference. He, he said his son was an engineer, very logical, and he said it was a simple, logical, rational explanation. He said it made a huge difference. Uh, it took him from the unknown, which is where I'd been, to an understanding of what he had. A great relief was to know it was a very common condition, so he wasn't alone, and it was great to hear that he had gone on here. Yeah. He, he was doing well. Yeah, and again, you guys in particular, because you, you're so logical and, and I would say left brain, you needed the, you needed the answer. The left brain was, well, what is the answer? And of course, as your brain brings up more and more chemist, chemicals trying to come up with the answer, it, it, it burns up more and more chemicals not being able to come get the answer. So he's a similar thinker to you in terms of left brain. And things like sleep, as I say, making sleep sacred, exercise that that guy got you got back pain water polo um and of course being in water polo is a whole other piece in um, positive mental health um and happiness of social connections being with other people was what we know is when a person by this time that green line starts sliding down they actually want to be on their own because they're going i don't want to be with anyone else because why would anyone want to be with me anyway and so and so they actually withdraw whereas in fact what they need to do is have more social connections yeah they actually haven't got the brain fuel to converse because that takes right. a lot. So yes. they withdraw, they stay away, and things get worse. Agoraphobia, they stay in the house. Right. They separate themselves. So for many reasons they withdraw, which is unhealthy. But you can understand why. Lots of adrenaline, but no brain fuel to actually connect the dots when you do converse. Because the thing is, you're in sales where you need to be out dealing with people. It's taking more and more energy to pick up the phone or get in the car and go and have a meeting. It, it takes energy which you haven't got and it takes brain fuel to hold it together and the easy thing is just don't go there. I, I found I was doing that less interacting because I found it tiring and I could survive but I wasn't in sales. I wasn't trying to make a living by communicate with people so I could hide a little bit. It wasn't any fun. Well, I'm just thinking um, uh, of, a, of a salesperson, you know, one, we've got a bit, we actually say, you know, selling is a contact sport, you actually have to go out and make contacts with people, and as you, as you, you, you go on that green line, and you are more and more brain fluid depleted, one, you're not as fluid and flexible, you can't roll with the punches, what's going to happen is you're going to convert less and less, which is going to put more and more pressure on you because you won't have been hitting target, and now you're going to begin to associate going and seeing people with pain rather than pleasure. And so it be, again becomes a, 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 po, a po, well, negative reinforcement in the sense that, or positive reinforcement, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Which again is why either you personally, as a salesperson or the sales manager or the business owner, needs to take that person and say, okay, we've got to have a talk, let's get some help, we've got to make some changes here. Particularly if the person has been a, a high performer or a good performer in the past, their skill hasn't gone anywhere, but their brain feel has gone somewhere. Yeah. 
It, you should help them from the business point of view, but, but you, you should help them because they're human beings. Absolutely. Get them back to their best. They'll love you for being the support person who really made a difference to their life on a personal level, and they'll be much better for the business and better for themselves and better for everybody. It's, it's very rewarding because uh, this is truly people in, 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 in need. I'll just quickly mention, there's a few reasons why people suicide. I was full of adrenaline, absolutely exhausted. I didn't want to live like that. Other people will convince themselves, particularly if they're angry, frustrated people, that if they kill themselves, it'd be good for everyone else. Mm. If they think, people don't like me, I'm biting their heads off all the time, they'll like the fact if I kill myself. And you can rationalise that when your brain feels are very low. It's wrong, but you can rationalise that. So there's a couple of different reasons from the two different pillars why people might commit suicide. The third one is to do with low brain fuels. A woman said, I don't care about my kids, I, I, I feel terribly guilty, and she considered suicide for that. So that was the sort of the, the, the sadness and the lack of joy in life, and she was guilty about that. So we've got a few different, these pillars explain three of the, the very important reasons for suicide, and some people have more than one. They might have two or three, so there's extra reasons why they might rationalise committing suicide. Mm, that was terrible, because the, the green line is way down there, and then, of course, if they get stuck into some um, grog, spirits, uh, alcohol, get drunk, or even worse, take some drugs or mix the lot, now their brain is really going haywire, isn't it? We think you get brain feel depleted. If you really want to mess your brain around, take some really strong drugs. Some uppers, if you want to feel up for a while, some amphetamines or, or some cocaine, something like that, or lots of alcohol or marijuana or benzodiazepines to, to, to get a little bit of peace, but then you're really starting to make your brain a confused place, and that's when we think you get into the psychosis and the far more serious mental health problems that are harder to recover from. Mm. So we think you've got to deal with this, it's important to deal with it, but it, it, with, with bad behaviour or bad strategies to try and get a lift out of your depression or try and settle your, your cluttered brain down, you can make your brain a, a far more difficult area to treat and, and a far more complicated place to, to, to try and repair. Yeah, right. Wow, heavy. What's the next slide, mate? Um, just, just a quick explanation, because it's very common to have... Um, have anxiety. So here we are, here's a normal brain. This is what happens. Um, so a significant threat, like you might think you're gonna have a fight at a football game or something like that, there's a bit of anger. So you, you'll kick into the fight or flight threshold. That's normal and it happens maybe once a month or something like that in real life. The person that's got a high level of adrenaline is always kicking into the fight or flight threshold. They're people who can't sleep. They're people who are wound up. They're tense and tight all the time. They've got an adrenalised brain and they're exhausted. And when you're exhausted like I was, then you start to think about not wanting to live like that. So we think there's a simple graph that explains why anxiety and panic attacks are so common with this condition and so paralysing. So, um, as I say, low brain feels a poor cognition and we think they explain lots of things. If your brain feels low, you get irrational thoughts, dangerous beliefs and potentially destructive actions. And some of the things we think, we think people that with, with a mental health problem can consider that um, being thinner, thinner is better, thinner is better, thinner is better, so they become anorexic, far too thin. We think radicalisation, people can be radicalised quickly, we think there's a mental health problem, then they get picked up by people and, and convinced about different things and then they believe that maybe there's the 40 virgins or something. So these people become dangerous mainly because they had a mental health problem and they were susceptible to, to dangerous messages. Well, we know we know one of the ways to influence or brainwash is to actually deprive people of sleep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So sometimes, I mean, there are courses we know where they intentionally deprive people of sleep to get the messages in there. So, uh, so certainly, if you want to radicalise someone, uh, depriving them of sleep would be uh, one of the strategies for sure. But, but sometimes they come, they're not fitting in, and all of a sudden they're, they're adopted by a group. They get all these messages, and then they believe what they hear. Yeah, drive a truck through all these people, or blow them, you know, blow yourself up, and it'll be a good thing. So. Yeah. It, it, it affects us, all of us, um, and they're easy to convince because their brain feels are so far out of kilter and they can't work out right from wrong. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, other problems, OCD, 
obsessive compulsive disorder, people repeat things because they haven't got enough brain fuels to tick off a task. They've got to keep doing things again rather than have good executive function, complete one task, move to the next one, move to the next one, move to the next one, which we all do all day. These people are never quite sure that they've actually finished a task, so they keep repeating them. Wow. It's, it's, it's a simple explanation for a fairly complex condition, OCD. Yeah. As I say, comorbidity, suicide. We know that mental health is, is the precursor to suicide. Uh, this condition with the high levels of adrenaline leads to alcohol and substance abuse, uppers and downers. Uh, if you've got this condition, angry, irritable, frustrated, then remote and withdrawn, you get marriage and relationship breakdowns. As I said, irrational beliefs and actions because you're not thinking well, you're not, you haven't got good cognition. And because the brain affects the body, there's health problems. If you're stressed, your immune system doesn't work well, so there's a possibility of cancer, gut problems with irritable bowel syndrome, tense muscles with chronic fatigue syndrome. It's related to, to many different things. So if we deal with the brain well, we can help a lot with health problems. Fantastic. And as we said, we're talking about health problems. We're talking about optimum performance in health. So we're dealing, as you say, sleep is sacred, dealing with the brain well, everything from from uh, irritable bowel syndrome to, to relationships with your husband or wife and all your kids or your dog, uh, all of those things um, come back to how well am I managing my brain fields. Exactly, yeah, the brain affects you psychologically and physically. The good thing is that uh, all the things you do for physical health are all good things to do for psychological health, which is sleep and exercise and everything else, so you solve. Yeah, you want to be physically and psychologically healthy and the same things will do both for you. Yeah. Just need the understanding that why you're doing them, why you need to do them. Okay. Um, as I say, big brain food users, I've mentioned some of them. So if we look at doers, politicians are susceptible to this condition. Winston Churchill is a famous one. Creative people like Robin Williams. No one better in the world as a stand-up comedian with Robin Williams at his best. But there was a downside when he got off stage and he committed suicide. Mm. Elite athletes. Kowalski ran second at the Olympics. He said, I cried for 18 months after, after that. Not every night, but he did because he expected to be a gold medal winner. High expectations. Lee, you're like me. You would love to be a silver medalist at the Olympics, but he was a silver medalist, but he thought he could be a gold medalist. Mm -hmm. So at many levels, people that you admire are affected by this condition. So you're talking about solutions now, how, how to protect yourself against pain for depletion, huh? Yes, and I'm saying there's all sorts of different stresses. So we've all got some, it depends on how big they are. Some of us have got one big one, some of us have got many little ones. So it doesn't really matter what the stressor is. We say the first level to protect yourself for, for mental health is first of all to have some knowledge. Mm. And knowledge, and, and, and we call this knowledge and hope because we think this is a message that explains it simply so that you can work your way out of it. So you need to understand how the stressors are affecting you. That's the absolute key, because then you can rationalise and, and we work add, it out. We can add to that list sales budget, making payroll, uh, paying back bank loans, debt, finance, all, all of those things start to come in there as well. And every, expectations of yourself, how much you're going to make, or how successful you should be, and then you might have a difficult boss, who knows, or... Difficult customers, customers as well, customers making customers. demands. And I want it done yesterday. No, you bloody let me down there. Like, so then you start stacking them on top of one another. Exactly. And you might be working long hours or there might be a lot of travel involved. Uh, you might have a problem at home. Somebody's sick, your wife's ill, or, or a child has an illness, and that's quite stressful as well. Sometimes you can cope reasonably well, but there's one or two things on top that might tip you over the edge, particularly if it's the end of years coming. So there's a range of things you just need to know and keep assessing how well you're coping with them and, and how much you can do. So we say that basic knowledge is, is absolutely critical, and for me, that's what I didn't have. I, once I had that, I knew where to focus my energies to try and get better. Yeah. So we say if you believe in the brain fuel depletion model and that the brain fuels are down, if you believe that model, well then we say we put our focus on getting the brain fuels up. So we do everything that's, that's non-drug. So sleep and light are two things that work together, good quality sacred sleep, diet, Exercise, connection with people, activities, doing things that matter, maybe volunteering or helping out. They're all things that pump your brain fuels up with non-drug methods. Medication helped me a huge amount, so that should not be discounted. So we're getting our brain fuels up. 
Once we do, we've got to say, what is the underlying problem? Can I just add to that? I mean, what we now know are things like yoga, meditation, mindfulness, that whole calming, and certainly into that yoga and meditation where you can go into that other deeper level of relaxation and sleep is a critical part as well. Um, and I think also in, in recent times, certainly um, some of the principles in and around uh, Buddhism in terms of uh, uh, non-attachment and putting things in a bigger perspective and not judging yourself against others. So your own thought processes and your own philosophy kind of can fit in and around that lifestyle component as well. What do you say to that? Uh, well, they're all parts of sitting and looking at your life and making an assessment of it, what's worthwhile and what's not. And when you take some time from a cluttered life to, to, to consider, to sit back and relax, uh, clear your mind or look at some principles, that is a fabulous thing. It's, it's part of that relaxation with your sleep that's critical. So all great things. Mm. Any time you take time to service yourself and your mind is a great thing for you, for your health. And, and for you, the people around you. And you've, you, I mean, you're you've been doing, you've just started some yoga and uh, in the last short while, haven't you? Yeah, the, the last six months, and um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. But a lot of it is, is exercise, as we said, but it's relaxation too. Two of the critical factors we've got in there, plus a consider, some chance to consider what the important parts of your life are and help get rid of a, a lot of the clutter. Yes, yes. Well, you you, you, um, you might talk about your 80, 20 year at some point. So yeah. Keep going, yeah. Um, so the third thing we think is, is you're getting your brain fuels up and you have to feel well and be thinking well, then you can deal with the issues. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to be a, a multi-millionaire or you're trying to prove yourself? You've got an inferiority complex? Have you got a, a difficult relationship problems or a job problem? Are you, are you a square peg in a round hole? What are the issues? Perhaps you've got some from, from the earlier life. You might have had some some issues for, right from the start. So there's all sorts of things you can deal with. You might be a high achiever and achieve, trying to achieve too much. But you need to be have your brain in a good position so that you can analyse these things and see what changes you need to make to keep the mental health intact because it doesn't matter. It, it, there's no fun having a mental health problem. So you, if you're like me, you'll do whatever it takes to make sure that you, your mind is calm. Now, you're saying there, which is a very important point, of Get, aiming to get your brain fuel in a much better state before you start to deal with the issues because otherwise you're saying if you start dealing with the issues but your brain fuel is still low your brain's still not functioning well anyway exactly so, yeah. a psychiatrist said to me if you don't get your, your, your mind back or your cognition back you may as well talk to a wall so a psychiatrist could do a lot of talking therapy but if your brain fuels are down you're stressed uh, you, they can't achieve much, so they need that to, to help deal with the issues. Sometimes the issues are, are, like me, I was trying to do too much, but other times they can be quite complex. It depends on your history, but you need your brain fuels up to be able to deal with it, to rationalise it, to work it out, to make the decisions. The other thing we think is important is to be surrounded by people that you find uplifting and supportive, and you, you need to expect to get better. If you talk yourself down, I always fail, I always do this, I, nothing works on me, you're in trouble. But I say don't deal with anybody who, who's negative or put, puts you down or has low expectations. Surround yourself with people who believe in it. And I'm in that, a group like that. My doctor said, you'll do well on this. I have lots of good feedback from people that have done well. And that's what I try to do is be an example for others. Great. Brilliant. I wish you are, mate. You're doing a great job. So let's keep going there. Well, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. We, we, we try not to be too complicated. We have the two pillars, the brain feels down, adrenaline up, and once you know those things and you know the personalities that are inclined to it, then you can start to work your way back. Get the brain feels up, the adrenaline will drop away, and then deal with the issues that drove it down. Don't take medication to go back to the same stupid lifestyle you had that got you sick. Perfect. And of course, talk about Clyde, because he's a bit of a legend in this field, isn't he? Well, well Clyde is a doctor who had worked it out. He treated people and he gradually kept thinking about mental health. And so he evolved. He, it's his term, brain fuel depletion. And he had all the explanations for me. So I wrote the book, but Clyde had, had all the answers. And Clyde is, is, a, is a super person. He's a saint. He um, had a friend who had kidney failure. Clyde donated him a kidney. Yes. 
So at every level, Clyde serves people, and I'm just fabulous to, to have the opportunity to spread the message of a, for a concept that he developed. I helped him refine it a bit, but it came from him. But we occasionally get people come and say, thank you, Peter, or thank you, Clyde, you've helped me. And that is about serve, that's about prospering, but that's also about serving, but that's about helping feel good about myself and saying, well, I'm actually doing something that, uh, that, that, that for some people does make a difference. I mean, and, and, and I think you're absolutely right, mate. And what I've noticed uh, with people who, as, as a person is more and more depressed, uh, they're flat out just surviving and looking after themselves. And that, as you say, there's an interesting phenomenon that when you're serving and helping others, often um, that's actually good for your mental health as well. That, um, I forgot that guy's name, Donovan, wasn't it? Act, belong, commit. That whole process of go out, take action, uh, belong to clubs and social connections and commit to a cause to helping other people, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, activity, they say, have activities that mean something. Say volunteering or, or, or having helping somebody and have connections, and that can often be people within those activities, having good connections, people that, that have like-minded, that, that support that, so they often go together. And so it's beautiful, act for long, commit. Very simple message again to try and help people that are suffering, trying to solve complex problems. So Rob Donovan, terrific. Uh, activity connection, um, very similar messages, and you know it could be volunteering with, with little athletics or something like that, but with people that give you a lift and have fun. Pretty simple, and that's how you prosper. That's real prosperity. It's not a lot of money. It's being with good people and feeling good about yourself and what you do. We right. I mean, we're talking emotional prosperity. Here. Yes. Yes. Emotional prosperity, and we know in business that when you have happy staff, they're far more likely to give high levels of service and when you give high levels of service you can actually there's a direct correlation between high levels of service people are more willing to pay for high levels of service high profit margins so it's a win everybody wins but it does start with happy healthy brain fuel depleted staff happy healthy brain fuel depleted self yeah um yeah, no, it's, it's, and we talk about emotional prosperity, I think that no one wants to be poor living in the gutter, but we don't need huge amounts, but we do need beautiful connections and we need to do things we believe in. So how do people get hold of you, mate, or uh, your material? I see there's a website there, is that the way uh, to well, do it? Brainfielddepletion.org is the website, so we've got information there and we've got some publications. But the model, free... The first three chapters and the third chapter's got the models free because we want people to know about it. If you, you think that's got any relevance whatsoever, you might buy a book and we'll make pay a few bills with that, but it, you know, you get the model for free. So we don't want anybody to suffer. I don't want anybody to spend five minutes like I spent six months because it was horrific. No, fantastic. So in summarising, here you are, folks, a model to explain uh, depression, brain fuel depletion, whether it be you, family member, people in your team, you're now going to have a better understanding of A, how do I identify it, and B, what can I do to both prevent it and then work with the person and work with my team to help them replete and of course then deal with the issue. And you'll see some of the other lessons that are on our online learning academy where we talk about coaching conversations and the grow conversation. We can actually begin to help people uh, at least at, in the workplace deal with issues, but if it gets uh, you know, pretty serious, then do get them to seek professional help. What would you say to that, Peter? Uh, yeah, as I said, if it's not you, it's people around you. It's just critical because there's so much clutter in the world, and it's it's not it's you know it's not going away. So you do need to know this stuff, and you can certainly help people if you do know it. Now, Peter, in terms of the next step, what do you recommend teams or families do based on the knowledge we've talked about today? Well, as I mentioned, at the personal level, you've got hope and knowledge. You, you need to understand the model. Uh, but that equally works across with everybody, all the support people. If the person that's suffering from this condition can show through the video that we have all the different symptoms they went to and what's actually happened to them and why they're suffering, the whole team, the, the support network that that people has, everybody is on side. They understand what they're going through. They forgive and so you get, and, and they can equally mobilise themselves so they can support the person in the best possible way. We get the whole team on board. We get a far more 
more effective uh, solution. So if, if people know, instead of these people being kicked out of the house and becoming homeless and being treated in prisons where they don't get any treatment or in hospitals, they can stay at home with their family and effectively be, be treated. So, and, and equally, we love people to watch the video because there might be some young kids there that might feel a bit down in five years' time. If, if they're aware of the model, understand it, they can protect themselves and we might save a suicide down the track. Absolutely. We say, yeah, it's a big problem, so the more people see it, the more people understand it, the more people recognise it could happen to them, then the better solution. How do they get hold of this DVD? Again, through the website. We have the book for the people that are readers and we have the video for people that uh, don't want to spend the time reading the book or, or for people who want their carers to know it's a simple, easy, 30 or 40 minute way of showing people um, exactly what they're going through and, and people understanding, forgiving them, but also being able to support them the best possible way. Okay, so get hold of that DVD via the website. Yes. Brainfueldepletion.org. Yep. Book, Fantastic. DVD. So Peter, have we pretty much covered everything? Is there anything else you wanted to add to what we've spoken about here in terms of brain field depletion and sales and service and prosperity? Um, well, I love what you're on about, Lee. I mean, everybody wants to have a useful life and um, there's many levels to, to look at it, but we all sell, and I, I sell the brain field depletion message. Mm. And we all want to serve because, as we know, activity and connection, they're the things that really make you, make you happy. They give you prosperity. So well, I applaud what you're doing, and I think, um, and, uh, as I keep selling mental health, it, it's absolutely critical to understand this so you can, you can really make people's lives good, your own, plus others. So um, I applaud the project, Lee. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, folks. And uh, we'll see you again on the next Sales Service Prosperity Radio. See you soon. Thanks, Peter.